And the Jews have used witchcraft to this day. Even we call them Jews, though they're not Jews because they follow Judaism. They follow the Kabbalah. They do not follow the Old Testament. Now I'd like to turn our attention to Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 6 because this is what is going to happen at the end of time. Now these believers in Thessalonica had undergone quite a lot of persecution and the persecution they would have received would have been from the heathen because Thessalonica was a heathen city. The Thessalonians had been heathen. But nevertheless, there would have been a certain persecution from the Jews, but not much. 1 Thessalonians, in, it says here in verse 13, how that these Thessalonians had received the gospel, and then in verse 14, they became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, Palestine. So in other words, they followed the gospel that had been presented through the apostles, first of all to the Jews. That's what they followed. They followed everything that the apostles taught, nothing else. Then when Paul came along, he had extra teaching. Because the Apostle Paul said about, uh, Peter said about Paul, Paul has taught such hard things that there are things I can't understand what he means. So when the Paul came along, they got it all. But this is what he says, you endured the same sufferings at the hands of your countrymen, the Thessalonians even as those Jews in Judea and Paul endured suffering from the Jews. And this is what he said in verse 15 and 16. Now first of all let me say Jews is not a, a very good English word. It was never in use until about the third or fourth print, printing of the of the King James Version. But anyway, we say Jews to simplify the matter. And it says, they killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. These Jews are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. Hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. And the wrath finally fell on those Jews in AD 70, when Jerusalem was captured by the Romans and burnt to the ground and many of the Jews were slaughtered. Now those Jews do not exist today. There's no Jew who is of the, a descendant of Abraham. Where are all their genealogical records? As a matter of fact, they're Khazars from Khazaria that used to be part of Ukraine. So these Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, had suffered affliction for the sake of the gospel. And then the Apostle Paul says, ah, but something's going to happen. The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled among all who have believed. Now first of all, the Apostle Paul is saying in verse 6, 
God is going to replay with refl affliction all those who afflict you, Thessalonians, now, who are living, I think it was about AD 52 or something like that when he wrote this book. They were living then. And the Apostle Paul says, God's going to repay all these people who are afflicting you when he comes to bring judgment. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in the flaming fire. And he's going to give you some relief. But at the same time, the Apostle Paul goes on further and he says, all those and all those who do not believe will have the penalty of eternal destruction from the presence of the Lord. So that is going to happen. But this is what's going to happen to the believers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. And it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. There's another scripture that we won't read, 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 53. So this is what the Apostle Paul is saying in previous verses. Won't all be dead. Not everybody will be dead. Not all the Christians will be dead when the Lord comes. Some will be asleep. They'll be in their graves, but their atoms still remain. And then the coming of the Lord's going to take place because the spirits of those dead believers are up there with him. Conscious, acting, working, praying as the rest of the scriptures disclose. They're asleep to us here on earth. They're alive in heaven. The Apostle Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He said, look, I'm, I'm in a bother. He said, I, I've got two things inside of me. One says, oh, I want to die to be with the Lord. The other says, I've got to stay here for the sake of you believers. He said, it is far better to be up there with the Lord. Now, of course, we don't really believe that. We believe it. Put it this way. It's not a, a burning it's not a burning hope. We're, we're very involved with living here. I am, even, at my age. But the Apostle Paul, he had a better experience. And that was his experience. But then he said, there's coming a time when the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And this is the order that he gave in this chapter of Thessalonians. And he said, he said in verse 15, that those who are alive and remain on earth, there's going to be some on earth when he comes. And he says, they're not going to go up in resurrected bodies before all the saints who are in heaven. It's going to happen simultaneously. In fact, in Corinthians it says, with the twinkling of an eye, that fast. And so the Lord will descend with the spirits of all the saints who have gone to be with him. They will come. The rest are still here on earth. They're the minority probably. I don't know. At the same split second, those who have descended with Christ will find themselves in their 
recreated immortal body that comes out of the grave in atoms and the Lord does a miracle and immediately they're in their bodies. Immediately, the saints that are still living find themselves in glorified bodies going up into the air to meet with Jesus and all those other saints that are up there in the split second. Don't you remember that the Lord created heaven and earth in six days and six nights? And if you've ever looked on the internet and l looked at the magnificence of the universes, and we know enough to know the world is an amazing creation. Happened in six days. You see, that's our God. We're only one person in seven billion people. Billion. Our God is greater than seven billion people. He can do things that we could never imagine. And we can't imagine that. We believe it with all of our hearts. Because it says in Hebrews 12, 29, you needn't turn, yeah, turn to this please. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, these words to the saints. For our God is a consuming fire. And he tells us in this chapter that we have to be watchful and careful because he's going to shake heaven and earth, as he says in 27. He's going to shake this heaven and he's going to shake the earth. That's what's going to happen to this world. And of course, we intend to forget it when we're so consumed with living, which of course is a natural thing. We're living. We're here on earth. And the Apostle Peter said, and you needn't turn to it, but you can write it, 2 Peter 3, verses 10 to 14. The heavens and earth are reserved for fire. They're going to be destroyed with fire. The first time it happened that there was destruction in the world, it was a flood. God put a rainbow in the skies that to let us know it will never happen again like that. But there's going to be a destruction. It's a fascinating account when you sum up everything that's happened in all the scriptures that we have, read it all. And this part is not so fascinating to the human mind. All the judgments, all the judgments that are promised. You see, we are meant to live solemnly and seriously in this world. And we are to realize that in the Gospels there is not one parable that relates to the second coming of Jesus Christ even though it's taught there is. Because they base their belief on John Nelson Darby's supposed revelation and cannot get it out of their minds. You know, the Galatians were bewitched. Paul said so in Galatians 3 verse 1. He said, who has bewitched you? Who's been using witchcraft against you? Somebody was. Would have been the Jews because they followed the Kabbalah. And the Jews have used witchcraft to this day. Even we call them Jews, though they're not Jews because they follow Judaism. They follow the Kabbalah. They do not follow the Old Testament. Every, I call him Jew, every Jew who goes to a synagogue throughout the whole world is under the teaching of the rabbis. The rabbis, contrary to what all the Christians think, do not teach the Old Testament. They teach the Kabbalah and the Talmud. Now there was a doctor here who's now left and he and I used to have some interesting talks and his grandmother was a Jew and he said to me, I'm going to investigate it. He says he's a Christian, Anglican. Well, you know, we had some discussions. Well, he went across to America and he came back 
and I was talking with him a few months ago and he said, you know, he said, I did some doctoring in the Hebrew uh, hospital, I forget the name of it, and he named two top Jewish doctors and he said, he just said to me straight out, they're so evil. But this is what I wanted to say. He said, I went to the synagogue in New York. Oh, he said, you know what they had up uh, on charts and what they were teaching? Not the New Old Testament. They were teaching the Talmud and the Kabbalah. So there you have it firsthand from the mouth of somebody who saw it. And he said, I left. And he's never been back again. So we need to realize that we're dealing with serious matters as Christians. And it is not a bed of roses. If you read Moses, David, those who've read it, prophets, you hear about the end of the world, but never are you given an indication. Not once. So when Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, he was not prophesying about the end of the world and the great tribulation that supposedly is going to come upon the world at all. Jesus didn't come to do that. Jesus came, first of all, as a prophet to Israel, not as a prophet to the world. Jesus came as the Saviour, first of all, for Israel, then for the world. The Apostle Paul said clearly, to the Jew first and then the Gentile. When you read the book of Acts, who got the Gospel first? The Jews until you come to Acts chapter 10. And that was the first household and the first people who got the gospel. But they weren't the first person. Okay, in Acts chapter 8, Philip, the evangelist, had been down to Samaria. The whole city had turned to Christ. They had heard Christ and seen Christ in my dad, if you know the story of the woman at the well. So when Philip went down because the Holy Ghost led him down and did miracles, the whole city turned to Christ. And so after that, Philip leaves carried by the Spirit into the desert. The Bible says that. So one minute he's in Samaria, the next minute he's in the desert. Now, I haven't heard of that happening to anybody since that time. Maybe it has, I don't know, but it happened to him. So what does he do? He looks up, here's a chariot, and in it was a black Ethiopian who had a scroll, because they didn't have Bibles, you know, they just had scrolls. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, no. So he invites Philip up into the chariot. The man is reading Isaiah 53. Now we know Isaiah 53 is all about the crucifixion that was to come and the death of Jesus Christ who died for our sins. He, there the whole chapter is about his death for our sins. And so Philip preaches to him. Then, the Bible tells us, Philip baptized him water because the Ethiopian said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, a black man. The first Gentile to be born again. The first Gentile who probably got baptized in the Spirit, but I'm not sure when that would have happened. The first Gentile a black man. And I, I, put that on, um, I put that on YouTube because there was a discussion. You know, you get all kinds of things. And we have a, an Indian friend who's a pastor and he's kind of brown and black, you know. Oh, he thought that was wonderful when I said that, you know. The first person was a black. And the blacks are cursed, aren't they? Really, you just have to look at them in Africa. 
there's a curse there that hasn't been on the whites. And I, I have said that to this friend of ours and he accepted it because he could see it. If you live in India, you'd see it because there's about 700 million at least. At least half of them are living like animals. The other half not living much better. It's only the upper crust and the middle classes that are living well in their country.